Okay. Uh, again, welcome back, everyone, um, to our uh, on our day two here for uh, presentations on um, the climate change uh, observations and pro and projections. Um, our presenters here <clears throat> are Aranzazu Lascarain and Ryan Boyles, and I will uh, give them a moment to uh, introduce themselves. I don't know if Aranzazu, if you want to introduce yourself, and then Ryan, if you want to introduce yourself now or after Aranzazu uh, goes, that's fine. Uh, either way you would like to approach is, is totally okay. But in either case, we'll start with yourself, Aranzazu. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Casey. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to join you all today. Um, I know I recognize several names um, on the participant list. Um, and I'm so pleased to see you all here joining us today. And, and I so wish we could be together. Um, I've been in a couple of these workshops um, in different parts um, of the East, Eastern US. And I always so appreciate uh, being together with you. Um, <clears throat> so Casey asked me to give you a little bit of an overview of um, easily accessible climate data that you might be able to use um, in your vulnerability assessments or your climate adaptation plans. And what I'd like to do is focus on the fourth national climate assessment and specifically on the Northeast and Southeast chapters. Um, let me just see if I can move this over. Okay, excellent. So these are the two products that I I'm going to be focusing on. Um, there's volume one on the left-hand side over here, you can see volume one. That's basically the, 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 the physics of the, the climate in the United States. Um, up until about 2016, the report came out in 2017. And then volume two is um, basically the impacts and risks and adaptation in the United States currently um, and some projections um, and it's broken down into chapters. So um, I'm gonna go over these both with you. Um, just like to let you know that the URLs are here at the bottom. And I think I've also placed the URLs and the chapters for the Northeast and Southeast into the Canva platform. So they're easily accessible to you. Um, <clears throat> so just to quick, just to quickly state that this report comes out roughly every four years and it's mandated by Congress as of 1990. So it doesn't matter who the president is of the United States, um, this is an act congressionally mandated and required to be put together by the various federal agencies um, to give basically the public uh, an opportunity to understand what's happening with our climate and to be able to have information to begin to plan for adaptation. And again, it doesn't make any policy recommendations and or evaluates existing policies. So just to quick just to quick say that we things are starting to roll out for preparations for the fifth climate assessment. So what is different this time around from the previous three assessments? So real quick, that might be of interest to you all is that it takes a risk-based approach um, to, the, to the climate impacts with the idea that it would help communities make decisions about how much risk is tolerable for the things that they care about, right? Um, and to let you know sort of, you know, the risks can vary as you'll see by a couple of the slides I show you, the risks vary and the intensity of those risks vary, but it helps you begin to visualize your communities within that risk space. And then second of interest is that <clears throat> tribal activity and resiliency case studies were added to each chapter of the National Climate Assessment. Um, and here you'll see some, some additional things that went in, but I primarily wanted just to highlight these two things, these two big items here that I thought would be of interest to you. Um, as you may know, some of the some of the indicators, these are just 10 indicators that go into sort of understanding the physics of what's happening with our climate. You know, whether it's sea level rise, sea surface temperatures, um, ocean heat content, uh, decline of glaciers and ice, sea ice, et cetera. And then those indicators um, get analyzed among many others um, in that volume one that I just referenced, the Climate Science Special Report. 
And so this is what it looks like when you land on that home page of volume one. Um, I've added here the URL here in big green letters. Again, it explores uh, the physical science of climate change in the United States. And just to, you know, just to highlight that this period that we're in now is the warmest in the history of modern civilization. We've basically increased the global temperature about one point, little under two degrees Fahrenheit in just the last 115 years. Um, and here you see this graphic here in the left-hand side are the various indicators that you can drill down on to understand basic phenomenon that are happening now um, in the United States. Um, and I would say that also this is more of a, a continental scale, where, whereas volume two, and I'll go into that, scales down into more regions. Um, so you can have a little bit more specificity, but if you want kind of a big picture of what's happening, then you can go to this volume one. So <clears throat> this is volume two again, this is what it looks like, the hard copy, but kind of looks like the same um, image um, when you get to the website. And here is the URL um, here at the very bottom. And I want to point out, so when you come to the landing page, two sections that I think are really important and easy to find information are here where you see the orange arrows are the report chapters and the downloads. Um, the report chapters, you can find your region and also sector, whether you're interested in air quality and agriculture um, or forestry or ecosystems, you can find those specific report chapters. And just to, um, what I've done for you all is I've, um, each of the regional chapters, so for the Southeast and Northeast, they have key messages that the authors, which are 300 plus authors that worked on this report, um, kind of have highlighted, you know, the three to five key important messages for that region. And so for the Southeast, uh, I've listed them here, there's four and five for the Northeast. So for the Southeast, heavy, heavy precipitation coming, warming nights, a change in plant hardiness zones and sea level rise. And for the Northeast, more frost free periods, shifting seasons, snow melt timing, heavy precipitation again also, uh, and sea surface temperatures. Um, and they've also focused um, on a um, lessening of the abundance of marine species, in particular fishery species, which um, I'll get into a little bit. Um, so this is where, <clears throat> when you click on the downloads, you see this page up here, and you can easily download by clicking um, to the specific information you need by chapter. And then, and then again, the chapter reports here, you can find your region, and then you can also find the national topics, whether you know, you're interested in coastal effects or forests, human health, um, et cetera. And everyone, please feel free to, to, to ask any questions as we go along. I want this to be um, helpful and informal, um, and I can dig a little deeper um, if any of these questions come up for you. So I just wanted to go over the, the, the key uh, messages for the Southeast. And I want you all to notice that on the left-hand side, there's historical information. So anything, the beginning of the turn of the 20th century, early 1900s to about 2016. So that's what things looked like uh, in terms of the number of nights over 75 degrees. And so you can see some of the hot spots here, say in the tip of South Florida, you know, more of those nights, of those nights over 75 degrees, also coastal Louisiana. And then on the right hand side, um, there is the projected future changes. Um, and um, we can get into with Ryan a little bit about sort of the high scenarios, the low scenarios, right? Because as we as humans don't know exactly what we're going to do, right? We can have one president four years and a different president the next four years and things could really change. So that's why there's basically a set of four different scenarios about what humans might do into the future. So you can see here on the right hand side that the higher scenario, you see what happens in terms of the number, the explosion of number of nights over 75 degrees and then with a lower scenario. <clears throat> Either way, nights, warming nights are definitely on the increase for the Southeast. 
Um, here is uh, one of the other messages, and that is um, that um, the Southeast is a, is a, is a fastly um, urbanizing area. People are moving to the cities. The cities are, are hotter than the surrounding areas and therefore demand um, a lot more cooling. Um, again, here is some of the projected information um, about the number. Interestingly enough, we can get this later, the Southeast hasn't been warming as fast as other parts of the United States. Um, so you can see this in this, the dots here on the upper right here, um, uh, and that's the percentage of change. So, but you can contrast that on the bottom um, with the map, and you can see how many more red dots there are, and that's the percent change increase in warming nights over that 75 degree period. And you can see the bar graph here that that's going up. Um, and that and that's difficult because all species need to cool and it worries us that the nights are getting more nights are getting warmer. Um, uh, the second key message is about increasing flood risk in coastal and low lying areas. And um, here is just a couple of, of images for you to look at um, some of the um, high tide flooding that we're seeing um, in certain areas, especially here. Um, there's a graph from Savannah, Georgia, um, the sea level rise projections in terms of number of, of days of high tide flooding. And again, here we've got different scenarios, whether it's the extreme, the intermediate, intermediate low, and what the trend is. Um, and so, um, you know, we've already in the Southeast have risen about three inches uh, of rising just in the, just since 1990. Um, and so again, the Southeast is a relatively lower line um, topography um, than parts of the Northeast. Um, and I would say that we're finding lots of communities like the Nares Paris who live um, in the plains in Idaho who are experiencing inland flooding. So it's not always just coastal areas that are finding and some of that has to do with the heavy precipitation rates that we're finding. Um, <clears throat> again, these are the days uh, with precipitation above three inches. Um, and again, just to kind of drill down a little bit here um, in the southeast, you can see the red dots. And, you know, there's some specificity here, right, that there's not such a big increase in certain parts of, of certain states and more so in other parts. And so hopefully this kind of information will let you sort of drill down where the reservation lands or homeland territories are. And so you can see what the trends have been looking like um, here up until 2016. Um, and then the third key message is natural ecosystems will be transformed. Um, this is something that I wanted to point out. Plant hardiness zones um, are shifting. Um, and here you can see in the left-hand um, graphic here, up until the end of the 21st century, you can see how many um, the zones that are shifted from historical over to the projected, you know, you can certainly see that in South Florida, for example, um, but also up until the mid Atlantic here um, by the darker orange. And so that also concerns us because as plant hardiness zones change that also means that plant communities will change. And so what we're seeing is especially in the southern um, Gulf areas is a shift of migrating mangroves, mangroves moving northward and replacing some of that salt marsh. So um, that gives you an idea sort of, of, of what's to come. Um, fourth is an important one as well. It, it relates to health risks, and especially for rural communities where you see the change in hours, um, work loss, loss of, out, of worked hours. Um, and you can see how how many hours lost that might be say for the gulf coast states florida uh, up until you know Georgia, uh, virginia north carolina um, so that's a concern also for um, human communities that work outdoors and then i wanted to shift over to the northeast now um, <clears throat> again the changing seasons are a particular concern for the northeast here we have sort of the timing of snow melt related um, stream flows. And here again, this is again, very easily downloadable information that you can drill down and find your reservations 
and see where um, some of those impacts are particularly more severe or perhaps a little bit less severe. Um, so here the red upside down triangles indicate um, more, more than 10 days earlier of snow melt. Um, and here you can see also surface, sea surface temperatures. You know, one, you can see this red line here going upward, um, especially in the summer. Um, and the Gulf of Maine in particular is one of the fastest warming bodies of water um, in the United States. So that has implications, um, as you may know, in terms of livelihoods, the ecosystem services that we depend on, um, and also the fisheries industry. Um, Key message three is maintaining urban areas and communities and their interconnectedness. Um, and there's some information related to that. Um, but here you have a, a kind of a graph here of the topography of New England and some of the coastal impacts and coastal erosion um, that will be happening um, with sea level rise. And this one I wanted to point up in particular is the fisheries, the Atlantic cod, um, lobster industry um, that may be of interest to you um, uh, for some of your data needs. Um, then I wanted to point out real quick that chapter 15 might also be of interest and that is the tribes and indigenous peoples chapter. Um, it, it focuses on livelihoods and economies at risk, the physical, mental, um, health and values-based health at risk, um, and also some of the adaptation already underway um, and issues related to disaster management, displacement of communities and community-led relocations. Um, so again, chapter 15 may also provide um, some reference points um, that you might want to consider for your, um, your plans. I also wanted to point out some case studies that might be of particular interest um, to tribes. And uh, in the fourth assessment, we had a case study related to ramps or wild onion that are of great interest to the Eastern Band of Cherokee. Um, that particular plant is of cultural, great cultural significance. Um, and it's already in its southernmost range. And so if warming temperatures might cause an impact to those plants, then there's um, concern of there of what to do and what kinds of management um, strategies to undertake. Um, so we focused on ramps. And then one that I'd also like to point out are the tree islands in the Everglades um, in South Florida that um, might be of interest um, to think about and how the climate impacts might impact these cultural resources, these important cultural resources that are also teeming, teeming with biodiversity. Um, invasive species, um, we know the southeastern U.S. is really a gateway to incoming native invasive species. Um, and to what extent communities want to either live with those invasive species or not. Um, but that's something also that is um, very important to understand. Um, should it begin to displace other species. There was also a case study we had on the Ile de Jean Charles band of Biloxi Chittimacha Choctaw tribe um, in coastal Louisiana um, and the impacts they've had to their livelihoods and community um, just because of the, uh, the really fast sea level, pace of sea level rise in that area. Um, and some of the strategies that they've undertaken to begin to pursue a community-led relocation effort just because they just can't uh, continue to, to maintain the integrity of the community there. But they also don't want to lose the rights and access to that land. So again, just to recap, I just wanted to go back and give three important big takeaways um, in particular um, for the Southeast and Northeast. So three big changes, it, get, it gets warmer, it rains harder and the seas rise. And I'd like to point out this is photo credit to Erica Henry who's on our call today. So thank you, Erica. Um, and just to go back, if you wanted a different continental scale for some perspective of your regions, then these, this is um, data coming from volume one. 
um, related to more hot days um, versus and less cold days. Um, so again, you know, we can get into a little bit more conversation about these various scenarios. Um, and there's typically four scenarios that are used and they're called representative concentration pathways, um, depending on how quickly we bring down um, those emissions. But you can see basically here in the very high scenario here in the bottom right, how, how incredibly, how many degrees of change happens to the continental US. Um, here's a graph about annual precipitation, um, especially heavy precipitation, precipitation events. Um, you can see historically on the upper left hand side there, and then you can compare it to um, um, Let's see, to the higher scenario emissions um, here in the bottom, and you can see where the area percent change is going to happen. So you can see New England and the Great Lakes region really increase um, in number of heavy precipitation events. Um, and here is projected relative sea level change up until the end of the 21st century. Um, and here you have, um, just a continental scale and you can sort of see the, the general areas in particular of the southeast and northeast um, and the number the number of sea um, the number of feet and sea level rise um, um, you can see it's not as much uh, say in say in, uh, the pan, uh, the peninsula of Florida but again that's already low-lying regions um, so even you know a three three foot increase um, can have huge huge impacts. Um, and, and then just to conclude, you know, climate change can manifest in many different ways. As we know intensifying storms, warmer nights, more frequent flooding, hurricanes getting stronger, and migration of plants and animals. So, so these are just some sort of categories in which to think about the impacts to your communities. Um, so in closing, you know, there's a lot of information already available to give you guidance with your decisions. Um, the, both of the reports, volume one and volume two, were written in such a way to be public facing and inform the general public. Um, so they're written as to eliminate a lot of technical, overly technical um, vocabulary and jargon and to make it easily accessible to implement and include this um, climate data into your planning. And I just also wanted to say that the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center um, and then our partner center, the Northeast, um, is really also here to help you locate these climate needs. Um, so with that, thank you very, very much. Um, and really welcome any opportunity to help you find information. And I'll be joining you in some of the breakout sessions today. Um, and I guess we can segue over to Ryan. Awesome. Thank you very much, Ron Zhu. And just real quick, I'll, I'll just chime in. Um, the uh, fourth National Climate Assessment, the uh, volume one scientific uh, chapter, and then mm -hmm. volume two on adaptation um, and impacts. Uh, those are on USET's climate change tools page that we looked at this morning. Uh, we will also uh, post those uh, in the Canvas as well. So you'll have uh, access uh, to those as references in your uh, vulnerability assessment and adaptation plans. So just want to point that out. And uh, yeah, uh, head it, uh, back over to uh, yourself, Ryan. Thank you very much. Thanks for that great overview, Aranzuzu. Um, I'm Ryan Boyles. I'm a climatologist with US Geological Survey, um, and I serve as the deputy director for the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. Uh, what Aranzuzu uh, presented earlier uh, is really helpful set of, of documents, especially for a lot of communities to get them started. And, and that may be, in fact, that's usually the, the first starting point that we recommend uh, a community when they're starting to explore their climate risk. Start with the National Climate Assessment, but it's really designed at, at a continental and regional scales. But there's a lot of underlying technical and scientific data that's used to produce those. We're going to dive into a little bit of that today. Um, now, because it is technical scientific data, it requires maybe a little more um, uh, technical expertise to use it. Um, we're going to go over some visualizations and some tools that, that try to help you uh, help communicate some of that uh, underlying data. Um, 
but it is much more, uh, it's not designed for the general public necessarily. Um, but I wanted to give you an introduction to that because I think many of you may be wanting to explore some of that data and allow you to get down to really um, much finer scale detailed data. Um, but before we get into that, I wanna give you a little bit of understanding about how you use it. And we'll spend a little bit of time talking about those scenarios that our Zoo mentioned. So the goal today is, is to real quickly here in the next 10, 15 minutes, give you a quick overview of the climate model projections that are used and how they're used to assess risk. And then we'll give you some examples um, just to get, sort of give you a flavor knowing that you've got your own time to explore. And then of course, I'll be around um, both uh, in some of the breakouts this afternoon. And then after the workshop, anytime you have questions, um, happy to help connect you to the data, point you to the data sets, help you with that interpretation of the climate model projections so that you get a better sense of, of what the risk to your community might be. <clears throat> so when we think about climate scenarios and climate models to help us sort of think about risks, right? So we use, uh, we develop a, a set of greenhouse gas emission scenarios. What's gonna happen to the future? What are humans gonna do into the future? And there's an international uh, uh, committee and uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that has developed these scenarios that will then use to say, okay, well, if humans do this, what's gonna be the resulting concentration of greenhouse gases? So they've agreed upon four scenarios that they've used for the most recent set of, uh, of uh, international assessments and then projected those into the future. And then what climate models do is say, okay, well, if these are the future atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases, what is gonna be the response in the climate system? So you have a set of scenarios that produce concentrations that then ultimately we use climate models to predict um, what the resulting uh, greenhouse gas or what the resulting climate uh, will be for those uh, greenhouse gas concentration scenarios. So a scenario, is a, a what if, you know, if, if a, you have a plausible future, what would um, a, uh, uh, the future look like if it unfolded? And then we can develop a projection. So what will be the projected climate change if the, scenario, if the future unfolded under any given scenario, right? And that's different than a prediction because the prediction sets some sort of, of uh, uh, likelihood or certainty for the future. And we generally think of these scenarios that are used to define or, or, or to help give us guidance for what if, what it might happen in the future as all being sort of equally plausible. We don't necessarily put in and say, well, this one is more likely than another, um, at least for the purposes of running these climate projections into the future. So a way to use this and the way we, we often recommend uh, is when you're thinking about understanding risks to your community is to look at this as a set of scenario planning that you prepare for. Right, when you think about predicting um, or forecast planning, you look at a single solution that might lead to some sort of future. But with scenario planning, you're really trying to look at a range of different futures and what the resulting um, impacts might be to your community. So you get a sense of where the risks are. Uh, what if it gets uh, a little bit wetter? What if it gets a lot wetter? What if it gets a little bit drier? What if it gets a lot drier? What if sea level rises maybe a little bit? What if it rises a lot? So that you get a sense of where the risks are, what the vulnerabilities to your systems are, and therefore what might be robust ways to plan for the future that account for an uncertain future. <clears throat> so it's important to point out that for climate scenarios, we're trying to understand what those uh, potential climate futures are. And you wanna look at a wide range of scenarios and therefore a wide range of climate futures to help you plan. And our climate models are used to project how the climate system is gonna to respond to those different scenarios. And this is an important distinction from a weather model where it's trying to give a specific forecast for what the actual atmospheric conditions are gonna be in the future. This is not what climate models are trying to do. Instead, the global climate models are trying to um, take a set of predefined experiments that everyone's agreed to, uh, well, the global um, climate modeling community has agreed to, and then collectively simulate how would the climate model or how would the climate system respond to those projected changes. And because we have as a global community agreed to uh, a common set of uh, experiments and a common set of scenarios, we can collectively use the, the, the knowledge that we've developed internationally to help guide what happens locally. So all of these global modeling groups agreed to a common set of, 
of scenarios and experiments that we then used to look at and develop a set of ensemble projections, not just a single forecast or a single projection, but a whole collection of models that help us collectively look at what the range of potential risk will be. And then we can scale those down to more regional scales, local scales, to look at what the range of risks are, because there is no single best climate model. Um, all of them do well at some things and all of them have some potential errors. And we can't necessarily say one is the best choice for looking at uh, what climate uh, projection to use for assessing future risk. So instead, we collectively like to look at a body or the ensemble of these models together. And that's important because a lot of the data sets and the visualizations that I'm going to be showing you and that I would encourage you to use rely on those ensembles of projections. So some things to keep in mind before we dive into the data. One, for your community or the system that you're looking at, whether it's a stormwater system or it's your community health response or maybe an ecosystem, the climate model projections are most useful when you have a well-established link between climate and your system, whether it's uh, the threat of invasive species, whether it's uh, changing for changes to uh, uh, urban uh, water levels from heavy storms. When you know those, those thresholds and those close linkages, then the climate model projections become a lot more useful. The other thing, it's, it's easy to think about the direct impacts. You know, heavy rain leads to heavy flooding. Uh, hot temperatures lead to um, uh, more hospital admissions for human health. But you should also make sure to consider some of those indirect impacts, right? So heavy rains lead to heavy flooding, which um, might lead to increased um, um, prevalence of inundation for mosquito-borne diseases. Or very hot days lead to direct um, health impacts um, for emergency room admissions, but it might also lead to secondary impacts down the road, longer-term health impacts that, that aren't necessarily as acute. So it's important to try to consider some of those indirect impacts as well. And so I'm going to go through a few examples here. I'm going to look at precipitation in the Northeast, uh, some temperature changes in the Mid-Atlantic, and then sea level rise in South Florida. And I'm going to use um, a handful of tools to visualize this. Um, and due to time, I'm not gonna try and do this live because it, it'll go a little bit slower. And instead, I'm just gonna use some screenshots, but in the breakout sessions this afternoon, if you want to, or Casey, if it, if it looks like we've got um, um, some time, we can go through and do some real time sort of question and answer and, and do some demonstrations if, if you think that's a good use of the time. So first I wanted to use something from uh, Seneca Nation uh, up in New York, where we're looking at, in this case, changes in, uh, this is for a specific community, the projected changes in wintertime precipitation. And what this is, is the historical value, the, the model uh, range for the historical value that's there in the most uh, left side, and then a range of different projections in the, for a higher emission scenario. So this has emissions continuing to increase, that RCP 8.5 is the higher emission scenario. And there's a couple things that stand out here that I want to point out. One, in general, the spread of the model projections and each of these dots is a single model projection for that emission scenario. You notice they don't all agree. There's quite a bit of spread. And as you go further and further into the future, the general signal is, hey, it looks like overall, the models show winter time getting wetter. And, and, and that's pretty consistent. But notice that some individual models show it maybe not getting quite as wet, that these numbers here at the bottom, sort of the tails of the distribution, show that actually not a whole lot of change. Some of the models show really tremendous change, like, you know, 60, 70 percent increase in wintertime precipitation. And all of these are valid projections for the future. Any of these are things to, that we want to be able to consider. So it's easy to consider, OK, what if you just look at the lower level changes? That's not a big change not a whole lot of change maybe in how you manage for that heavier wintertime rainfall. But what do you do when it looks like there's almost you know, a 70% increase in rainfall? How do you manage that in the wintertime? And thinking about robust planning for adaptation, especially once you get more into those adaptation plan sides, how do you think about a robust plan that lets you account for what might be very large changes as well as smaller changes? And in the middle of the distribution is what is often looked at, but should not be the only thing you look at for a signal for where the trend is going. So this is uh, one of the tools. This is from the uh, climatetoolbox.org, and this is linked. I'll, I'll show you at the end of the presentation here where this is linked. And all of these are, are linked with a quick summary overview for you uh, in the Canvas site. So let's look at another tool. This is the 
uh, climate, this is through the climate resilience toolbox. This is called the climate explorer. It's another way of exploring some of the underlying data that was used in the national climate assessment. So in this case, we're also zoomed into uh, uh, an area of the Seneca nation uh, in uh, uh, Western New York. Uh, in this case, we're looking at total precipitation, not just winter precipitation, but total precipitation. And it's another way of visualizing both the historical conditions as well as the projections for the future. Now, what you see here is in the red line is that higher emission scenario, and you see quite a bit of spread for annual emissions, as well as a lower emission scenario. This is RCP 4.5, if you are interested in the technical part of it. And what you see is a lot of spread, but at least an annual total precipitation, not necessarily one clear signal for increasing or decreasing. And I, I put this up there to show you that there's another way of visualizing it, but also it's important to think about where your sensitivity is. Are you more sensitive to say seasonal precipitation for your system of study? Are you more sensitive to annual precipitation? Or might you be more interested in the very heaviest rainfall days? Because a lot of that information is available, but it, um, the way you visualize it, the way you access it, the way you interpret it uh, might be different. And yet a third way of looking at rainfall, this would be summertime precipitation. Uh, this is uh, using a slightly different data set, but again, zoomed in in that same area of, of Western New York um, uh, in the Seneca Nation. And this is a way of looking at the model projection slightly differently. This is actually a way I, I, uh, uh, I think is more effective in communicating the range of possible climates that you wanna think about. So here we're looking at, again, a higher emission scenario in the middle part of the century, um, but it shows that actually conditions in the summertime could be between two inches drier to two inches wetter and thinking about what that range of risk is. And the single, you know, the average of those projections of all the model together suggests maybe a little bit drier, but there's quite a spread that you want to be thinking about when you think about how to uh, put together a vulnerability assessment and an adaptation plan. And you can look at this over space, but you can also look at it over time. Um, this is a way, another way of sort of looking at that similar type of box plot that we looked at before um, from the climate toolbox. Um, this uses a, a thing called climate uh, voyager. It's yet another way of visualizing it. Um, and you can see here again, the spread in summertime precipitation, there's a lot of variability there. There's not a lot of necessarily confidence in the models predicting that it's necessarily gonna get wetter or drier. So how do you handle that? Well, one way is to start thinking about if all of these are valid scenario or valid projections, realistic things that might happen in the future, how do you prepare for what might be a future summer that is both wetter and drier? Um, and a robust plan will allow for you to consider both of those. So that's a precipitation example. And in particular, rainfall can be very difficult, um, especially across much of the Southern tier of the US. Um, there isn't a clear signal necessarily for all seasons as to whether it's likely to get wetter or drier. One thing that we do see uh, consistently across all the models is it gets warmer. So for example, now I've, I've zoomed in to uh, I believe this is where uh, Rappahannock um, uh, Indian Nation's headquarters are uh, in the Indian Neck. Um, Aranzadu, I think you spend, spend some of your vacation time up in this part of the world, right? Yes, yes, beautiful. Uh, it is truly beautiful. I, I spent uh, many a summer on the James River uh, doing teaching at a, a scout camp. Um, so I know and love that area. This in, is going back to that same uh, climate toolbox um, uh, tool that I used uh, earlier. In this case, instead of looking at precipitation, we're looking at days where minimum temperatures um, stay above 32 degrees. In other words, don't get below freezing. And what you see is a big increase in the number of warm nights. This echoes the same figure that Arantzazu showed earlier, um, the historical, as well as what those projections are in the future. And in this case, all the models show it getting warmer. Some of them showing getting quite a bit warmer where there might be very few nights where it gets below freezing um, by the end of the century but still other models showing maybe not so dramatic a change. Um, another way of looking at this, going to the, oops, um, the Climate Explorer from the Climate Resilience Toolbox is another way of looking at this. So this is again, the same uh, uh, way, uh, same variable. In this case, looking at um, the decrease in the number of days where it gets below 32. So instead of looking at it as the total number of days where temperatures stay above 32, this is where the number of days where temperatures get below 32. Again, centered on that same location. So you can zoom into an individual point instead of necessarily having to look at regional products or national products like are in the um, um, uh, national climate assessment. 
So in this case, you're showing it a couple different scenarios as well as the historical data showing that recent really big decrease in the number of freezing nights, but also what the trends are in the future. You see that central line and you, your eyes kind of want to focus on that. But what you really want to look at is that spread in the model projections because that's an important way of assessing the range of risk. Still a third way of looking at that same set of projections, another set of data, a map product where you zoomed in and looking at the spread. Um, in this case, looking at that higher emission scenario, looking at the mid-century, the time period there, 2060 to 2079 as compared to the historical period and what that change is gonna be. So in this case, the multimodel average suggests you know, upwards of a month and a half of fewer uh, freezing days, you know, losing effectively a month and a half of winter. But it's also important to point out that there's quite a bit of spread in the models here and that the models don't all agree. They agree in the trend. They say it's definitely going to get warmer. There's going to be fewer uh, cold nights. But that exact number, there's quite a spread there. So you need to be thinking about what happens if we lose, you know, two to three weeks of winter versus what we happen to lose, for example, you know, 60 plus. That's two months of winter loss. What does that mean for your community? And yet another way of looking at this into the future, comparing the different scenarios a higher emission scenario versus a lower emission scenario, and what how that spread in the model futures might, <clears throat> excuse me, might change. So we've given a precipitation example. We've talked about a temperature example. Let's zoom in and look at sea level rise because that's something else that a lot of the coastal communities are interested in. This is using the NOAA sea level rise viewer. Um, allows you to really zoom in and see what areas are likely to be inundated under different um, water levels. So you can go to another uh, report or series of reports that look at what the range of potential future sea level rises are likely to be, and then go in and explore and say, well, what does that mean for my community? So we zoomed into South Florida here, um, where Seminole Nation has a lot of its people and a lot of its natural resources managed and just highlighted, you can change this bar over on the left side to look at different levels of inundation and see what areas are gonna likely be inundated and where those low-lying areas are likely to be flooded. So it doesn't tell you necessarily when this occurs, it doesn't tell you by which you should plan for everything to be permanently inundated, but it does let you get a sense of where those low lying spots are and where the areas are likely to be of higher risk. Therefore, where you might wanna think about if you have critical infrastructure, critical communities, or critical cultural resources, how should you manage those knowing that the sea levels are gonna to continue to rise and, and when they get to these critical levels, um, you're gonna see more frequent inundation and, and eventually permanent inundation. So a few takeaways from this and some messages I want you to keep in mind before we um, get into questions. You know, the climate models that we use are really our, our best uh, consolidation of the scientific understanding of how uh, changes in greenhouse gases are gonna affect our climate system. And they can be really useful to assess risk. Um, we use plausible scenarios and a whole collection of models to collectively get a sense of what our, our range of risk is. And we use that range of models because we wanna better understand and characterize both uncertainty and risk. These climate models and the data sets that I've shown you in the visualizations are really most useful when you have a clear understanding of the linkage between um, your system of study and, and the climate drivers for it. And these downscale projections and these data sets can be really useful, but as you've already started to see, um, interpreting those, getting access to it, uh, can be a little bit tricky and choosing which data set to use is a little bit tricky too. So, there is no single best climate model. You never want to use just a single climate model to give you a sense of what your future risk is. The other thing is you want to look at climate projections that are relevant on climate timescales. You're not necessarily trying to say, you know, what's my risk next month or next year, or really even in the next 10 years. Climate timescales over 30 years or longer, so three decades. You want to start thinking about what's the climate risk, what I need to be thinking about over much longer term timescales, because that's really what these climate projections are designed to do. This screen here, I'm not gonna go into it because it's already in your Canvas system. There's a PDF version of this. Those blue links are live, so you can click on them and they will take you to the link. And I've tried to include a few strengths and weaknesses for each of these. There is no best visualization tool out there. Um, none of them have all of the right uh, ingredients, all of the right data sets, all of the right visualization techniques. Um, so sometimes you end up sort of picking and choosing which one is best for your situation in your community. Uh, so with that, I will turn it back over to Casey um, for any questions that we have from the group. Awesome. Thank you very much, Aranza Zhu, and thank you, Ryan. And yes, we do have time uh, for some uh, for 
uh, questions and some thoughts on the uh, presentations you've seen. Um, I have a, a couple I'll share, but let me hold on to those for a second. Um, I think uh, we have a, a question from uh, James Charles. Uh, go for it, James. Brian, I appreciate you, Tyler Ronzu. I appreciate yours as well. It's always instructive to hear you guys talk. Um, and Ryan, I know you probably answered this to me a million times, but you also probably know I'm pretty dense, so it probably takes a million more before I comprehend. Well, from your experience uh, with dealing with projections and working with, uh, uh, with entities and communities on applying uh, projections to decision making, how important is it that you're accurate on whether it's 20 days, more days that are going to have 100 plus temperature versus 15 versus 30? Uh, or is it more important that you just understand that there's a trend going forward? When does accuracy on your projection become critical versus just understanding which direction things are going trending? Okay, so that's a really good question. And I'll, I'll sort of rephrase that and, and, and for the rest of the group, if, if you don't mind, James. Uh, and, and that is, it really depends on, well, the, the question that he's, that he's asking is is, is, is it really important to know the details of these specific numbers and the really precise numbers that are provided, you know, whether it's 22 degree increase or 23 degree, you know, all those, or is, or is the general trend important? And it really depends on the nature of the system that you're studying. For a large community plan where you're really trying to capture, hey, what are we as community generally going to do? General information, hey, it's not going to get as cold, it's going to get warmer, it's going to rain heavier. Those creep or and the sea levels are going to rise, right? Those four key things are probably the most important things for every community. All of you are probably going to be talking about those same basic components. But let's say you've got some critical infrastructure that you understand and you say, you know what? Once we see this threshold reach, once we start seeing sea levels at this level, once we start seeing uh, uh, rainfall amounts above this amount, once we start seeing temperatures that exceed this amount, we see a real step change in how our community responds. We reach to a point where our, our hospitals can't handle it. We reach a point where our, our, we know this road is going to be flooded, and that's an important corridor. We know that these critical resources, whether they're historic um, or cultural uh, or um, you know, um, financial resources in a community, um, so, suddenly become not viable anymore. Knowing those critical thresholds, then that accuracy becomes really important. Because you can then start to say, hey, as we get further and further in time, we know that risk of reaching those critical thresholds start to increase. And it helps you plan, what am I going to do this year? What am I going to do in the next five years? What do I need to be thinking about more as a 10 to 20 year plan to make our community more resilient? So in short, it really comes down to the nature of the system that you're studying and how much um, detailed understanding you have of your system. If you have a lot of detailed information, having those detailed projections become really helpful. If you're speaking in general terms and doing generalized planning, general guidance for the trends for the future is what's most important. So if I understand you correctly, Ryan, if you don't mind, Casey, to just follow up to make sure. Uh, so it would be appropriate, for, particularly for our area where there's a lot of uncertainty in South Florida, if we did that scenario planning and created a range and just define adaptation triggers, when we hit this point, this is when plan A kicks in. When we hit, when we hit the next point, that's plan B. When we hit the, uh, the, when we hit point C, when plan, when plan C gets in, that's when we all start playing. Uh, is that, is that sort of, uh, um, how, how you make that transition from generalized to now specific comes, comes, comes important when you really don't know, when you really can't predict those specific details with any great level of confidence? You know, Jane, that's a, that's a one strategy for doing it. And actually that's closely mimicking a, a style of planning um, called robust decision-making where you set um, signposts down the way at which point you're gonna have to make different decisions. Um, so you don't try to make all the decisions now, but you try to anticipate where, you, where the crossroads are gonna be where you need to start making decisions. Um, and so that's one way of doing it. There, there are several different strategies that are out there. And really, the, the one that works best is the one that is, uh, works best for your community and what your community sort of um, thinks about and what resonates with them most. So what you've, what you've described is, is a very valid approach. 
Awesome. Thank you very much, Ryan. And, and thank you for your, uh, for your question, James, too. Um, yeah, let's, uh, we still have time. So let's keep this going before, uh, before we break for lunch. Um, are there other questions for um, uh, Aranzazu or Ryan um, or some uh, thoughts and comments of what you've seen in this presentation? While uh, folks are thinking, um, I'll just share kind of uh, a couple thoughts um, from the presentation. So um, going back to yesterday, when we're looking at vulnerability assessments, <clears throat> you know, the uh, kind of the two uh, variables and looking at risk is, of course, your um, the likelihood of something happening and then the consequence of uh, something uh, happening. And so it seems like, uh, you know, looking at, at both of those um, with uh, the projections, you know, we could have, you know, varying um, degrees of, of likelihood or confidence, uh, maybe could be the word that um, something is going to happen. It's going to be, um, things seem uh, more certain for things like uh, temperature and sea level rise um, in those trends. I'm like, okay, going to be doing that. Uh, warmer, uh, increasing uh, uh, sea level uh, rise. Um, Precipitation, uh, we've seen generally like kind of wetter towards uh, the region, but a lot of that in the winter and then summertime things start to, um, can go in different directions. Um, but on the other part of this, the, the consequence side, I think part of it is in the vulnerability assessment, um, you know, taking that step and looking at your communities and your tribal nations and identifying like those things that if, were affected, it would be like, you know, a high um, high consequence or high area of, of concern. Then comparing those to some of the, the likelihoods of, of things happening is gonna help you get, I think could help you get that answer of, of the risk um, and priority in there. Um, but uh, I'll just stop by saying, um, I think in some of the cases, as we said before, um, doing kind of a qualitative assessment, looking at it is like, okay, you know, we're looking to plan for some degree of sea level rise, or we're looking to plan for some degree of warming um, and, and changes and adapt and starting to plan for that is, is the way to kind of begin and go through those. Um, I think just as tribal nations are updating plans, which we're seeing too, uh, tribal nations that have plans are often after a number of years, getting new information, new information on projections and things like that, that can go into updates. And uh, things like the National uh, Climate Assessment, which is uh, generally, you know, by law supposed to be updated about four, four or five years. So those help to fill the information. In conclusion, these are kind of ongoing processes that you're planning for um, uh, in your community. So I'll just uh, stop there and just mention that Aranz is also posted in the chat um, another uh, important resource, the U.S. Climate Resiliency Toolkit, um, and the link is, is posted in the chat. So thank you. Are there other, uh, other questions or thoughts? If, if there's no specific question, because that's a lot of information sort of thrown at you at first, if anyone has a specific um, request or data set they'd like to share real quick, I can try to walk through with a live example uh, in the last few minutes we have before lunch break. But I also recognize that folks have been writing and listening a lot this morning and, and certainly might like an extra five minutes back. Yes, and I think um, also we will have our breakout sessions too. Uh, we have a breakout session, I believe, 2 uh, p.m. Eastern, on climate change observations and projections. So this discussion can kind of continue um, and opportunities either to look at uh, some of these tools or look at these pertinent sections in the National Climate Assessment. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, just uh, going back to the, the chat, um, uh, Corey Lucero, Lucero and Juan Cancel um, says thank you to both Aran Susu and Ryan. 
um, for sharing and um, always helpful information. Um, and glad you got to share with everyone. So uh, thank you, Corey, and thank you, Juan. And Casey, I just wanted to say that um, <clears throat> I've sent you my presentation um, that you can post if you'd like to can Canva. So if folks want to review that, mm -hmm. especially for instructions on how to access the information I talked about, you know, feel free, <clears throat> folks should feel free to use that. Yes, I'll post the uh, um, Aranzazu and Ryan's uh, presentations. If I can get those in, I think I got uh, yours, uh, Ranzazu. I might put it into PDF form just to make the file a little smaller, but it, it'll have the slides for everyone. So everyone will have access to that. So um, very good then. So what we can do is um, get ready to take a uh, lunch break here um, just to let everyone know We'll come back at uh, 1230 Eastern, just a little check in, see how everyone's uh, morning has been so far. Um, and uh, uh, like we can we can keep it brief or use uh, a little more time for this check in. Our breakout rooms will start at 1 p.m. Um, and we have uh, forest ecosystems um, with uh, Tyler Everett and Sarah Smith. Um, uh, natural resources uh, with Olivia Ledi, um, Erica Henry, uh, Lauren Nichols, um, and I believe Martha uh, will be joining as well. Um, we have a, a USET staff uh, who will be joining uh, that section as well. Um, uh, Leah Zeiss, who is our um, agriculture uh, programs manager, uh, program manager at USET, um, as been available for uh, a little time and I think is going to be joining you all in the uh, natural resources, fish and wildlife uh, uh, session um, uh, as, as a resource uh, for her to have information to share. Um, and then of course at 2 p.m. We'll, we'll have the breakout room, sea level rise and coastal ecosystems to continue and a breakout room on climate change observations and projections if we'd like to uh, continue this conversation. Um, so that's uh, our afternoon. Um, when we come back, we have a presentation later in the afternoon, but I'll get into that when we come back at 1230. So um, if there's any other uh, questions, uh, feel free to, uh, to ask or check in before we sign off for lunch. Um, let me just keep that open for a moment. Any questions on what's coming the afternoon? or uh, any other questions or concerns. Okay, uh, not seeing any or hearing, seeing any on the chat or hearing any. Um, I am going to uh, close this Zoom link briefly so I can download the recording um, and have it uploaded onto the Canvas. So um, after we can, conclude, uh, I'll be closing this for a few minutes and I will be sure to have it open for you all to rejoin uh, at or before 1230. Thank you very much.